Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, I'm going to do a little special feature here about my mission trip I took when I was at Southern uh, Adventist University. This was last um, spring break for me, 2014, and I went to Nicaragua. If you can see up there, Francia Serpi. Um, the top corner up there, that's where I went. It's a little... Um, little tiny village kind of in the jungle off the probably about 70 miles off the coast um, the ministries was uh, or the region was Tazbaraya Adventist Ministries and um, well actually we flew there from Houston all the way to Managua the capital then we took a little plane from uh, uh, Managua to Porta Cabezas, which is on the other side of the country. And then this little, this old truck here was, uh, I don't know, you know, like a 1960s, 60s uh, army truck. And we all rode, rode in that about six hours on a dirt road. Uh, we, we packed in here, as you can see, all our luggage and everything. Really bumpy uh, ride. Uh, we didn't get there until probably midnight. Um, sometimes we had to get off and walk because there's a dirt road and it was pretty muddy um, but it was made for an experience you were covered you were covered uh, whenever you left you were clean and then once you got there you're just like caked with dirt kicking up from the uh, truck uh, there was actually a uh, Adventist radio uh, broadcasting over there so I took a picture of it um, here was the uh, the church here that we went to. Um, a lot of the people there uh, don't, I guess you wouldn't say, actually they're Catholic, a lot of them, but um, the uh, there's like witch doctors in the uh, village, so some are big into that uh, practice still. So the Adventist church there, um, it's pretty awesome because it's pr right in the middle of the uh, uh, the town there. Uh, let's see, this is the inside. You can see it's it's kind of like a barn almost. Uh, you would see bats flying in and out during church because it was, it was open. Um, oh, this is a picture of one of the hymnals there. They, they didn't speak, it was like a Indian uh, dialect or it was called Mosquito. It's kind of, some of them spoke Spanish depending on how uh, often they went to the um, the city there, but this is uh, to God be the glory in their language. So it's pretty cool that they have their own little hymnals there. This was a daily meal. Uh, we It's called uh, Gallo Pinto, beans and rice basically, and then those dried plantains. We honestly we ate this every single day. Um, yeah, every meal, every single day. But that's all they had, and they they enjoyed it. So you know it was okay. The first couple of days, we got a, this is yeah. Um, what I went there for was uh, I went on a nursing mission trip because that's what I was going to college for, and we were going to do uh, clinics around the um, the the regions. We took a uh, truck. We took that truck I was showing you around to like five different. Uh, cities or villages that that week and this is the main clinic where we got everything you can see there they had a little pharmacy in there and they would get all the uh, supplies and um, stuff in the city before we left and we would have a bunch of uh, antibiotics or uh, vitamins whatever the most common thing that we gave was uh, just uh, Tylenol and eucalyptus because a lot of people just had back pain because they were working so hard in the fields. Um, but uh, the doctor there, he's uh, the f head of the missions there. Um, he's full time there and he was an awesome guy. Uh, he lived, he was from Nicaragua, he went to school. He spoke three different languages. He went to medical school in Russia and he also lived in the United States in California for a little bit, but he's from Nicaragua, so he knew Russian, Spanish, and English, and he was a really nice guy. Checking out somebody's ear there, some probably irrigating something. Uh, 
we had little babies and they would come in a lot of times they would say the mothers would say we'd have to have a translator because we didn't know obviously what they were saying and um, uh, so a lot of the kids would come in with like stomach pain and it would be probably because of intestinal worms that because the food and water was contaminated and it's unfortunate but they look like they're full and like bloated but really it's the uh, parasites um, yeah, just piling in, getting ready for clinics. It's a very fun experience. Okay, well, also, some people came on. We probably had 15 people. Five of the people weren't uh, there for the medical part, so they actually, this church right here, it was a, they were building another Adventist church in one of the uh, communities. This was Esperanza. And uh, so they would get in that truck, and they would get all the lumber and stuff. And I think I have an after picture of what they... Uh, what they did. Okay, so they actually put a roof on whenever I was whenever I was there. But this is, I think, a few months later. They had the walls up and everything. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and that's what it looks like. This was like a month or two ago. One of my friends sent me this picture. So yeah, now it, they got a, another Adventist church around there. Um, this was the Adventist uh, mission there. Um, see the little black water uh, tank thing. What they do is there wasn't any running water, so it would, it would rain, you know, nine months out of the year, rain season, so they would just catch it off the roof and we would just reuse that for uh, washing our hands, showers, whatever. So we had to conserve it because uh, whenever I was there in March, it was actually the dry season, which it still rained a couple times, but uh, so that's what we used for our Hygiene purposes. Uh, just another picture, picture of the mission. This is where we stayed. It was called the Ark, little compound they built there. Had bunk beds. You can see our mosquito nets. We had, we did have to take malaria precautions and some, but I actually didn't think I ever saw a mosquito. Um, but it was pretty fun. Actually, it was kind of funny. Um, you could see little little mice running around in there. Uh, one time I woke up in the middle of the night because I could hear the little mouse crawling up my mosquito net, or what I thought, and I was yelling to my neighbor above me. I said, hey, turn on, oh, turn on your flashlight. And I, was, I got scared there because I thought that mouse was crawling up. So you could just hear it, but yeah. Um, yeah, the bathrooms were not my favorite part, I would say. Uh, really, it was just a hole in the wall or in the ground there that was dug, so you just kind of had to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> um, dirt road, I like to, uh, I like this picture because it's one of my friends, he was, uh, we couldn't fit in the, in the truck, so he had to just ride in the trailer back there all the way, and it was a pretty cool picture there. Um, oh, this is the shower. I'm sure you wanted to see that. Okay, this is, um, a lot of them, because we we did have to accept some some type of donation whenever we did the uh, clinics or something, because I I wasn't sure exactly why. I guess because some people would just look for any way to get some type of med medication or something, but a lot of them didn't have any money, so they would give like I think this is like plantains, yucca, some other I can't see something, but yeah, oh eggs I see eggs up there. But yeah, you know, it reminds me they gave what they had for any uh, type of um, help. And I mean, it was very awesome to see because they don't have much yet. They'll give their food away. This was the general store. This is their Walmart, basically just a little hut and they have all these little, little supplies. Um, Going to town, it depended on how much they knew Spanish on how often they went to town. It's like I said, it's about a six hour dirt road ride and you can see, I think you can see, they piled on, uh, they piled on those trucks because they would only come around. Nobody had any cars or anything. Some had, you know, dirt bikes or motorcycles to get around, but uh, we were the only car in the, or truck in the village so you could hear every time we went anywhere because it would start up and everybody would get outside of their little hut. Um, Tried to socialize with them, make some friends, even though we didn't know their language. Played volleyball with them in the village. I was playing with the kids there. 
Um, they'd play with little sticks and a little wheel looking thing. Um, oh yeah, this is cool. One of, one of my friends, Cody, uh, was working construction and he, something, the hammer actually like chipped off and it, a piece of it flew into his arm there. And the doctor actually let me uh, stitch it up. He was trying to guide me, so that's really cool. Because, I mean, we don't learn that in nursing school. But uh, I was shaking, definitely. But he was willing to let me. It was a really uh, uh, fixed, sterile procedure. Um, those gloves and everything are. But it was, uh, yeah, he was really awesome to see that and try to do a few stitches. Um, so we... Yeah, just doing more clinics. This, I remember this guy here had a hernia, actually. A few of them did, and we couldn't do anything about it because obviously we couldn't have surgery there. But you could feel the uh, intestine kind of bulging down, and whenever he coughed, you know, you could feel it. Um, the Adventist School is right in the center. It's actually a very, very nice place compared to all the other villages. Uh, this was like a basic house. You know, it's kind of off the ground wood. They didn't have any... Obviously, I didn't have any air conditioner or anything. But I went in one time uh, to see a, one patient. This lady had a baby. And, you know, it's just a mat on the floor, like a little thing. And they just sleep in there. And, I mean, that's basically it. It's not like they have a kitchen or anything. And it was uh, sad to see. But uh, also that baby that we went to, like I said, they're, they're kind of into, like, the witch doctor stuff. I guess she tells them to wrap the umbilical cord around the baby. And sometimes that can be dangerous because some of the babies, I guess, have have uh, died in their sleep because they've choked around the umbilical cord. So you have to go in there and try to tell them, you know, don't do that and <laughs> see how they're doing and whatnot. Another house, just a general, not looking too, too uh, homey. Kids were great. That's a lot of the reason it was such a good experience. Um, they're so happy with what little they have. They don't really know any better. So, um, you know, makes everybody happy to see that. This is their uh, meal. They would uh, kind of smash the rice. They would just take turns with those little, whatever, rock-looking things and just beat it until they had rice. Um, they carved out their own little canoes. It's pretty interesting. Cows <laughs> uh, getting ready for a clinic. You see that little uh, square-looking uh, little thing? They would we would get go down by the river, get a bunch of sand and like dirt that had washed up, uh, dump it in there, and just mix it with water. And that was kind of their uh, their mix for building. Um, and it worked. They put some other powder in there. So we went, we traveled around, did a bunch of clinics, and we had our own little, uh, all these things that they're carrying is like A through Z, um, uh, like pharmacy stuff. So we had it down to a science, and it was, we saw probably about 70 to 100 people a day. Um, oh yeah, and the, like I said, the majority was back pain <laughs> and uh, paras a lot of, lot of parasites. So you'd give a lot of like uh, anti-worm helmet stuff. And uh, the other guys would work while we did the clinics. They would work on the, the stuff that the compound had, like the cars, the foilers, so they could get around. Because actually, actually, these guys were in like school for auto mechanics, so they knew, they knew a lot of stuff. Um, building the school, we were actually building another school there, so they were working on that, which was really cool. Just the kids like to listen with our stethoscopes, you know, listen to their heart. They would gather around and you would take turns. Um, oh, yeah, I actually got up. Actually, this guy right here was the doctor's son. I still talk to him today. He actually lives down there, and he has his own CD. He's trying to get into music. He was going to school in Oklahoma City for a while, but his visa got denied or something again. But uh, he got me up there, and I actually sang a song with him in Spanish. Not really knowing the words, he was just whispering to me in my ear. Uh, but that was pretty fun. Um, yeah, part of the compound again. And this was our group. 
Um, everybody was from around the, everybody went to Southern and then a couple sponsors, one of the, the main sponsors up there at the top was the auto mechanics uh, instructor down there. He had been going since he was in high school, I think in the 70s and he had gone, he only missed you know, five or ten years when they were having like a little revolution down there or something in the 90s, but he's gone, you know, 20 plus years every year and he really enjoys it. Um, yeah, they would pile on, like I said, this is all the school desks coming on that dirt road. Um, another kid with a little Bass Pro Shops hat. Uh, and that was the view from the uh, place. It was a nice, place in the jungle um, and I think that's that's what I have but I think my point was you can uh, you get real appreciative real fast if you go out you know see what you don't have and what these people have and see how appreciative they are um, with what little they have so it really opens your mind to uh, thinking well if you're somehow not getting uh, grateful enough you think in America I'd uh, encourage you to go on a mission trip for a few and you can see how other people are living and it uh, really changes your life and it's good for you so that was my mission trip I'm glad I did it and I would definitely do it again so thank you for listening If that is not love, let's sing the first and the second. Well, we'll sing the back because it's not on the hymnal, so just put attention on the words on the screen. Thank you.
Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day and for the wonderful rain that you've brought us this week. We thank you for bringing us all here safely. Lord, you've heard the requests that have all been given today. You've heard and you know each one in detail, and you know how to answer each one. And Lord, we pray a special prayer for Candy and her brother Jerry, and we pray you would lift him up. We pray that you would send those to him that can encourage him and give him a good word. And we pray, Lord, that you would send him to your word, the Bible, to, to find encouragement in your word. And we pray for Tim at CY Bree. And um, Lord, you know, um, we thank you that uh, he has found a naturopathic doctor and that he can help him. We just pray you continue to be with him. We pray for healing, Lord from your power if it's your will lord we pray for your um, healing for him and we pray for mike dalton for his shoulder surgery and we pray for janet and um, jail ministry and roseanne as they go may you bless them may you encourage them and give them the words to say and we pray especially lord that you'd protect them and keep them safe and send more people to them lord that can help them with the ministry especially men and we pray for Haley Crome, who has been sick for so long and throwing up. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, you would help the doctors, give them the wisdom to know what to do and how to help her. And we pray for Nathan, who is in jail in isolation. We pray, Lord, if it's your will, that you'd be able to get him moved somewhere. And we pray for Tony and all his buddies that are in the Army there that are working so hard. We pray for encouragement. We pray for strength for them and your protection and we pray for um, the closing on the house that it would go well lord and that um, you would be with them and and help them to get this home if it be thy will and give them peace about it and we pray for the chicks and thank you for the testimony that it's been to those around them and we pray especially lord for fran uh, we miss her lord here and we pray lord for encouragement for her and if it's your will, we pray that you would bring her back to church. We thank you for all your blessings. We pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to be with us today through your Sabbath day. In thy name, amen. A lot of uh, talented musicians in this church. I, I especially appreciate those who stand up here and sing because I certainly can't sing. <laughs> and you know, you you really don't have to be much of a musician. You you can just kind of be here and make a joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> so that's about the best I can do. But but I have the good fortune of of having very dear friends, Brian and Roberta, agreed to help me. So, um, we'll see if we can't make some of that noise. Thank you.
Thank you for the music. And I, I wanted to say that uh, thank you to, to all of those who participate in our worship programs, whether it's Sabbath School and the Divisions or with our music and our musicians up here today. You know, it's, it's wonderful to come together and to worship together. And, and so thank you for that. I was setting, I was noticing the, the change of the, the flowers back here. You know, they, have you ever noticed these changes with the seasons? And uh, they, it just happens during the week. And, and so thank you for those who are a part of that and come in and, and just make this worship just a wonderful place to come and worship together. Well, we're in Revelation still, but we're coming towards the end now. We're, we're making our way through. We're today going to look at chapters 15, 16, and 17. After today, there are only two more presentations for Revelation that we'll look at. Next week, we'll look at 18, 19, and 20. And then two weeks from today, we'll look at 20 and, I mean, 21 and 22. And so we're kind of on the back half. We're working down the, the chiastic ladder, as it were. We saw the pinnacle at the top already. The, the conflict between uh, Christ and Satan, really, the great controversy. And, and now as we come down to that, we see some conclusions. In chapter 15, we see again the victory of God's people. We see mention of the Lamb standing there around the sea of glass. And I love starting there because it's going to be talking to us about our Redeemer. Revelation chapter 15. And here he begins with this sea uh, in verse 2. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And, and I hope that we will be there. That's my plan. Is that your plan? That, that we'll be there at the, on that sea of glass. And, and this is the song that we will sing. It says, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. You know, for, for God's people who, we've been in this world of sin long enough, don't you think? And it's a mess. Satan has made a mess of this world. And here at this point, we're saying, God, you're going to take care of the mess. You're going to get her done. You're going to fix this. I was talking with the youth uh, uh, in Sabbath school today, and I mentioned something about sin that I had heard uh, from one of my professors up at Andrews. And it's kind of like this. If you have a picture, and, and God created this beautiful picture called the universe, you can have a perfect picture with no flaws in it. But you, sin is like a hole that has been put into the picture. And God's love and his government is this beautiful picture. And this is what he made without any flaws in it. And Satan has come along and poked a hole in the picture. Now you can't have sin without love. You can't have a hole in the picture without the picture. And so sin can't be without God's, God's love, God's government. It's like a flaw or a mark. But someday God's going to fix the hole in the picture. He's going to remove the hole. He's going to get rid of the hole, and he's going to make the picture complete again. That's what these things are about. And for God's people who's been living in this flawed world, God's about ready to fix it and make it right. And we won't have a picture with a hole in it again after he's done. Isn't that good news? That's, that's what this is about. And so that's what the saints are talking about here. He goes on in verse 5, and we again see images of the sanctuary and the temple. And uh, it talks about coming out of the temple, the seven angels having seven plagues. They're clothed in pure, pure uh, linen, bright linen, having their chest girded with gold bands. One of the four living creatures that's there at the throne room of God hands uh, the angels the seven gold, uh, golden bowls full of God's wrath. 
Now, let me explain God's wrath here for just a moment. God wants to fix the picture, and it's time to fix it. It's not that he is having this road rage kind of thing that sometimes we experience when we're mad at somebody. God is finally stepping up and said, this experiment has gone long enough, this cancer, it's time to remove it, and he's going to get the job done. It's gone long enough. And so it talks about his wrath but it's not like the anger that we sometimes experience. And then verse 8 says something very important. It says that the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. There's two other times in, in, in history around the sanctuary and run, around the temple when this same thing happened. We have, we have one time when we see it in the wilderness, when Moses completes the wilderness uh, tabernacle and God comes and settles with the cloud and fills it with his presence and the priest can't go in and minister. And likewise, we see it also in 1 Kings. And that's the one I want you to look at. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. This is Solomon's temple being dedicated. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. And it says, And it came pass when the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So we've seen this two other times in earth's history. Now it's happening in the heavenly sanctuary, and what is it telling us? Well, if Jesus is our high priest, according to Hebrews, and if he's doing the work of ministry, interceding on behalf of us, and that's the Day of Atonement, and you see that work, it means that Jesus has finished that process, and he has come out of the temple, God's presence, Jesus is God, but you've got to understand the symbolism here. God's presence fills the temple. No one is able to enter during these plagues. How does that give us a timeline then for us today? The plagues happen after the judgment process is completed. After the seal of God is on his people or the mark of the beast is on those people. When that process is completed, then you see this image here in verse 8 that says what happens next happens after the judgment process is over. Everyone has made their decision now either to be with God or against God. And so these plagues that are about to be poured out are going to be poured out on those who have chosen to go against God. And it's like the Egyptians and the plagues that happened there in Exodus. The first three plagues in Exodus happened to everyone, but the last seven plagues of Egypt only fell on the Egyptians. God's people were protected. They were kept from the plagues. There will be a distinction made between God's people and the rest. God will protect his people, but the rest of the world will experience that. Chapter 16 now gets into those angels Bringing, bringing and pouring out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And I hope you were able to pick up the little handout that was out, uh, out front. It has the seven last plagues on this side and a little bit of a grid, and then Revelation 17 on the back, and I think I saw some more uh, back there, but I, I want to refer to this. And if you didn't pick it up, catch, catch one on your way out. There is much discussion in biblical scholars about whether or not these are literal things that happen or if they're symbolic of other things spiritually that's going to happen. In fact, there's enough debate that when um, Seth Pierce wrote his book, um, Revelation Made Simple, he simply chose to list both of them, the literal and symbolic. Andrew's study Bible kind of does an interesting thing. They, they, they basically say it's both in this way. The first four seem to be very real things, real events.
but then the last three seem to be symbolic. So Andrew's study Bible says uh, some are literal and some are symbolic. So I, I've given you both the literal and symbolic, and depending on which camp you're in, you can follow along. I think they all have good things for us to learn from. And so these are the literal and symbolic of the bowls of wrath. And why are we so nebulous at this point in this? Because it's yet to come. It hasn't happened yet. It's still to come. And when there are prophecies that are yet to come, it's harder to nail it down than it is when we look backwards to prophecies that's already been fulfilled. So what, what do we take from this? Just understand these are things yet to come. If you are on God's side, you don't have to worry about these. And so it's only for the rest of the world. God's people will see this happening and it will be very clear at the time that it happens. We have not come to this point yet. God's judgment is still underway. The door is still open for probation. People can still make decisions for God now, but that will change sometime in the future. So let's look at these seven bowls that are here. The first one is a, a, a loathsome sore is what it's called. It's interesting that those who have endorsed or used corrosion, I can't say it, those who are forced people in spiritual matters will suffer sores like in Egypt. You might remember the boils that they had. The same word in Greek here in Revelation is also used when they translated the Hebrew scriptures from, uh, from Exodus. It's the same word, the Greek word there, and it represents the sores. And it's, it, they call it boils in the Old Testament, but it's, it's a very painful sore. You see that in Exodus 9. You also see these same sores in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Interesting, isn't it? That when Satan wants to come and accuse God of playing favorites, that finally his final act against Job, after taking away his wealth, after taking away his family, that when he decides to take away Job's health, that he uses these painful sores that's on his whole body. Isn't it interesting that now here at the end of time, it's those who are unfaithful to God who ends up receiving those sores. Satan started it, God finishes it. Symbolically, this could represent those who have been oppressing God's people will themselves be oppressed. Something will happen that will make their lives difficult. They've been making it hard for God's people over and over. Probation is closed. God's now stepping in and it becomes difficult for them. The second and third bowls represent, uh, it says it pours out and first the oceans are affected, that they turn from water to blood, and then the fresh water in the earth is turning from water to blood. And this is significant, where in earlier visions we had seen one third of the earth affected, now it seems that this is pretty much worldwide type of event. It's very, sim uh, it very much falls in line again with the first plague that happened in Egypt. You might remember the very first one that happened was that the Nile River turned to blood. And of course that was rep representing that God was more powerful than the Nile God, that he was the true God. And so we see that earth's water supply, both salt and fresh, turned to red blood. And there's a reason for that, because so many of God's people have been persecuted and martyred. Their, their lives, their blood has been spilled because of their faithfulness. And now God is in turn giving back what they had given to his people. Symbolically, it means that those who prefer false religion have fouled the streams of truth and now blood is all they will have to quench their spiritual thirst. That it's no longer flowing freely to them anymore. The fourth bowl or plague is that the sun will scorch the earth. It's going to be hot and oppressive. And uh, here, Seth, I, I took this from his book. He'll be the worst sunburn in history. <laughs> Those who follow God will have his protection from the sun. And I think this is important. In Psalm 91, it tells us that. But look at Isaiah 49.10. And I think we'll have it on the screen. There it is. 
I love this promise. You know, I, I remember, this is on the world. This isn't God's people. God's people will be protected. And here's one of those promises. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. Isn't that a great promise? Memorize that one, because when this world goes haywire, you're going to want to claim that promise. That's for God's people. You will see the fulfillment of that uh, as God's people. Good news for, for those who are following him. Symbolically, this represents the wicked filled the earth with darkness. Now it's appropriate that they face the exposure to the full brightness of the sun. And there's two verses that kind of suggest that on that side. Look at Malachi 4.2. Speaking of God, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Now, today we don't think growing fat is a good thing, but that's a promise of good things to come, isn't it? It will be fed and taken care of, and, and so we see that. Now, look also at Revelation this is um, Revelation 1.16, speaking of Jesus. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, or his appearance, was like the sun shining in its strength. And so symbolically, this, this sun coming to the earth would be God's truth being poured out in such a clear way, there's no, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about who God is and the truth about him. That's what they would say on the symbolic side. The fifth bowl comes and is poured out. By the way, these bowls come very rapidly. This is not stretched out over a hundred years. This is happening within one generation and frankly it's happening in a very short period of time because what you're going to find in the fifth bowl is that people who are suffering from the sores in the first bowl are here also talking about the pain of the fifth bowl so they're still around the people who have the sores are still there those who had the sores and didn't have fresh water they're still there by the fifth bowl so it can't be a long drawn out process because of what's happening. Short period of time. The fifth bowl would be darkness there on the, the beast that falls on the beast's powers. Again, one of the plagues of Egypt was darkness for three days. You can find that in Exodus chapter 10. And this could be a very literal event that happens on some of the, the key players, some of the key powers that have brought about this oppression to God's people. And, and so it's a very possible, real thing. God's done it before, he can do it again. But symbolically, it could also represent, because of the bottomless pit of persecutions, now God darkens the world of the persecuting beast power. Darkness kind of suggests isolation. That so now there will be a pulling away, no longer the support of those that have, have brought falsehood to this world. Uh, and you'll see that in the next chapter, that the political kingdoms will start pulling away from the false religion that has been brought to this world. And you'll see a separation between those yet to come. Well, the sixth bowl is probably even more interesting in what it says. It talks about the, the three, the dragon, the water beast, and the land beast deceiving the world. It talks about frogs coming out of each of their mouths. And you might remember the plague of, of frogs there in Egypt, Exodus chapter 8. Interestingly, that plague was the last one that the Egyptian magicians were able to imitate. You might remember when Moses first came to Pharaoh and he threw his staff down on the ground, it turned into what? A slithering snake. And Pharaoh looked at his magicians and said, can you do that? And they said, well, yeah, I think we can do that. And they threw their staffs down and they became snakes. Don't ask me to explain it. It just happened. It's weird stuff. 
Of course, then Moses' snake, staff, goes over and eats the magician's snakes and swallows them whole. And then pretty soon he grabs the tail of his snake and it becomes a staff. The magicians, were, they lost their walking sticks. They were gone. But you will see that in some of these things, they will imitate some of God's uh, some of God's plagues. The frogs are the last ones that they're able to imitate or say, oh, that's not really God, that's just a trick. And, and, and that's really what's happening here in these last days, is that it's a deception that says, it's not really what you think it is. And it's not how they're saying, and, and people who are upholding these things, it's not really that way. It, it's, it maybe is this way over here also. And so they cause confusion and deception. And this is what's happening. They're going out to deceive the whole world. In fact, so much so that they bring the world up against God and his people and his city. Now, Armageddon has both a literal place over there in the Middle East. It's a valley. It's the valley of Megiddo. There's, there's a mountain over there called Megiddo, and there's a valley. It'd be pretty hard to put, to put the whole world's population into that valley. There's a real place. Or it can symbolically represent this just rising up to, to stand against God, to shake our fist against God and His rules and His ways and say, we're not going to do it that way. We don't like what you have. We're going to do it our own way. And so symbolically, the sixth bowl can represent the signs and wonders and miracles that bamboozle the senses and cause the careless to lose their solid footing in God's truth. The battle is a spiritual choice, uh, is spiritual choices we need to make to be on the winning side. Here in this one, uh, the sixth bowl it also talks about the river Euphrates drying up and getting ready for the, king of the, the kings of the east to come and conquer. In Daniel's day, that actually happened. It was a real event. The, the Babylonians had been fighting the Medes and Persians. They had been on the move, and an army had gone out to, to fight the Persians, and uh, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar was left in charge of the city of Babylon. And all he had to do was just keep the, the city gates locked, and he was going to be okay. But you might remember the big party he had, and they got careless. But what was happening outside the walls that he didn't know was that they were digging a channel, because the Euphrates River ran under the wall on one side and through the city. Now they had walls to protect that, but they weren't paying attention. And one night, while they were having the great party, they diverted the water out of the river just long enough to lower the river level so that they could, the armies of the Medes and Persians could wade underneath the walls. And they got inside, and then they discovered that the gates were left unlocked on the inside of the city along the river. And they marched in, and they took the city in one night. Well, from where Babylon stands geographically, the kings of the east are, are the Persian kings. They definitely are from the east. This happened in the past. But what is it talking about here in Revelation? The city of Babylon represents Satan's city. Jerusalem represents God's city. It's Satan's city is about to fall because the king of the east, who is Jesus, is about to come. And Jesus is taking away the power that was there and the defense system that was there. Satan cannot stop the coming of Jesus. He can't stop what's about to happen. No matter what he has done and no matter how many people he has brought on his team, he can't stop what Jesus is about to do. And, and so the kings of the east are coming, representing Jesus. And the Euphrates River will be dried up. No defense system left for the city of Babylon. The seventh bowl is really in the context of when Jesus comes. The earth could not survive. Humanity could not survive on earth if we were to try to live anywhere beyond this event. Because the earth is almost decreated. Islands are disappearing. Uh, hail is falling, the, si you know, the size of basketballs and bigger. It's, it's detrimental. Cities are collapsing. The whole world is falling apart at this point. This is when God comes, Jesus comes back. And interesting to say, for the wicked, 
They're angry at God at this point. They're mad at what he is doing and how he's interrupting. They're angry and their hearts are hardened. Even when they see Jesus in the clouds, they are not converted. They would rather he would go away and leave them alone. But because of his glory, they cry for the rocks to fall on them. It's a very sad thing for the wicked at this point. Symbolically, it could represent the seventh bowl, the final natural consequences that results when people break the laws upon which this universe is founded and they blame God for the consequences. Literal, symbolic, maybe both. Interesting that both of these have lessons for us to learn and understand from these bowls of wrath that are poured out. Chapter 17 is the last chapter we want to look at and we get some pretty crazy dreams here also. It talks about a shady lady riding a purple dragon. And you see some imagery again that we can start uh, uh, defining. She first shows up here coming out of many waters. And if you look there, many people support her. That text is Revelation 17, verse 15, not Revelation 1. I'm sorry for the typo. But Revelation 17, verse 15 tells us, that as, he, as he's being told the meaning of that vision, the waters which you saw where the harlot sets are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This woman is supported by multitudes and peoples and nations and tongues. It's a worldwide support for her. The kings of the earth, it says, the political leaders that support her uh, the, for the money that they can make is basically why they're in support. The kings of the earth, political system supporting this false religion. And what is the shady lady? Who is that? Well, God's people were represented earlier in Revelation as a woman who was clothed in white, standing on the moon, 12 stars, representing God's faithful people. This woman is God's unfaithful people. His unfaithful church. The one that says, I'm a follower of God, I'm married to God, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to have other gods in addition to Him. An unfaithful church. Christians by name, idolaters by practice. And there are three verses I want you to look at real fast because it suggests this in the Old Testament. Isaiah 121 is the first one. Isaiah 121. How the faithful city, this is speaking of Jerusalem, how the faithful city has become a harlot. It, is, it was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. It says, here's God's people who have become unfaithful. Look again at Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, verse 26. Speaking of, again, God's people. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians. Your very fleshly, fleshly neighbors and incre excuse me, increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. Do we have, do we have the other verses? Or? Okay, great. Behold, therefore, I stretch out my hand against you, diminished your allotment, and gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians, because you were insatiable. And indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. So you've got the Egyptians, the Philistines, the Assyrians. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea. That's Babylon. And even then you were not satisfied. You see, they went after the different gods of the different lands. They left the true God. And it says that here's God's people who have gotten caught in adultery, who have not been faithful to him. This is God's people in the last days. They call themselves Christians, but they've gone after other gods. The word mystery that's on her forehead in 2 Thessalonians 10 verse 7 refers to lawlessness. And she leads people to break the law of God. Do we, do we have that 2 Thessalonians? There it is. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, Paul writes, 
Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. There's a day coming that this lawlessness will just be let loose. It says that she is a mother and she has daughters. And this represents in the last days Christianity will spawn many distinct distortions. But one thing they will all have in common is that they will forsake in one way or the other God's commandments and they'll hold tradition above the word of God. Oh, that's a dangerous place to stand. For any of us, for any of us, if we will hold anything other than God's word at the highest, we can find ourselves in, in deep trouble. The purple beast that's mentioned there has seven heads, ten horns. It's those political powers that have united with a spiritual to, to work together. In the last days, the religious system is riding on political power and using that to force people to worship their way, <coughs> similar to what we have already studied. It's interesting that it mentions seven kings, and, and now these, these kings, uh, it says that five are dead, one is now, one will be and then will not be, and then the eighth one is kind of a part of the seventh one. And that gets a little confusing. But most Bible scholars have agreed on this particular thing, that the five dead kings represents the powers that have oppressed God's people from the time they were coming out of Egypt. So Egypt would be the first one. All the way through, you've got Egypt, you've got the Assyrians that took the ten tribes of the north away into captivity. You've got Babylon that took the two tribes off to Babylon, that's Daniel and his friends, you remember that, followed by the Medes and Persians, and then also Greece. Alexander the Great came through. That was before John's day. And then the political power that was reigning in John's day was which group? Rome, the legs of iron in Daniel 2. The beast with the iron teeth uh, was in John's day. And then there was a power that was going to come that was not yet in John's day, but was going to come and then it would not be there. It would have power and then it would lose power, but then it would show up again later on. And that was that Christian, the medieval Christian church that was both political and religious from 538 AD to 1798 AD. And that's when they lost their power. 1798, it waned. And, and yet we now see that same power being revived again today. The eighth one is an extension of the seventh one and what it will do. It started off with lamb-like horns, but it becomes to start that earth beast will begin speaking like the water beast. They will work together. So that eighth one is an extension of the seventh. And we talked about that in last time. Revelation 13 is the United States as being a part of that. Clearly, that's where we stand right now is we're not quite at that point. We're almost there where the United States begins that type of oppression. We're not there yet. That's yet to come. So somewhere, yet to come, unfaithful Christianity will work with political powers to enforce her way of worship. In the end, you'll find that the kingdoms will turn on the unfaithful church. The beast, those ten horns, it says will turn on that unfaithful church. But by the time they do that, it's really too late. And God's judgments have completed. Probation has closed. As these plagues are being poured out, they finally realize they had followed the wrong group, but it was too late. And so they turn in anger against the ones that had misled them. Those are things yet to come. We're not there yet. Interesting studies. We have more to look at next week when we get into chapter 18. It will pick, off, pick up where we're leaving off right now. So it, I, I want to leave you hanging, study it, look at chapters 18, 19, and 20, because it will keep going right where we have left off at this point. So keep studying. We're going to keep looking at it. Stay faithful to God. And these things we don't have to worry about when we're remaining faithful with Him. Children. Good job, good job. Y'all are filling it up.
Is there? Yeah. Okay, good. You want to bring it around? Mm -hmm. You want me to put it in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Put that in for me. Thank you. Yeah. All right, kids, thank you so much for getting all that money. You know what we're going to be doing with that money you're getting? We're building a new church, and it's so awesome we can't hardly wait to start. How many of you know what this is? A helmet. A helmet. Do you know what to do with this? Put it on your head so you're you, safe when you're doing motorcycles you, and four-wheelers. Four-wheelers and motorcycles, and you put it on your head to be safe. Yes. And bicycles. Yes, and bicycles too. This is really important. Do you know, uh, have your parents ever told you to put one on? Yeah? Have you worn one before? I Yeah? It goes on like this. If something hits me right here, it won't hurt my mouth, will it? If something hits me right here, it won't hurt, will it? We've got to wear our helmets when we're out playing. After we're done, I'll let you, okay? Now, I want to tell you a story. A story about Daniel and a story about Ryan. Oh, these were good varmint boys. And you know what? They were the kind that obeyed their moms and dads. But they were varmints who had motorcycles. And Daniel loved to ride his motorcycle. He was really, really good. And I would see him back in the backyard, and he'd have his helmet on, and he'd be jumping his motorcycle, and he'd be riding, riding wheelies and doing donuts and just having a good old fun time. Daniel had a younger friend, just a few years younger, but his name was Ryan. Ryan loved to ride motorcycles too. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Me too. I like that. I have a four-wheeler. You know what? That Ryan would wear his helmet too. And those boys would go off and play together. Well, Daniel was such a good rider that his daddy thought he'd build him a motorcycle track out in the backyard. And that was going to mean got to bring in a lot of dirt and build these hills back in the backyard so he could jump across them. And Daniel's dad started to bring in the dirt. And he's going to build this motorcycle track. Well, Ryan comes home from school one day, and the, and the dirt was starting to pile up in the backyard. And Ryan got all excited. And he boogity, 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 boogity right on down the street over there to Daniel's home. And he knocked on Daniel's door and he said, let's go see your dirt. <laughs> so they went out in the backyard. And you know what? The boys were so excited. And Daniel, his daddy had a four-wheeler. And Daniel said, hey, let's get on my dad's four-wheeler and let's go try out the dirt together. Well, now these boys, they knew to put their helmets on. They knew, but today they forgot. And they didn't put their helmet on. And both of them got on that four-wheeler. And they went over there to the dirt. And they, whoops, they started climbing that four-wheeler up the dirt. And you know what happened? It fell backwards like this. Boom. Uh-oh. I think something like that happened. <laughs> you know, I'm not real sure. Were you wearing your helmet? No, I didn't. I didn't. Zach, <laughs> you have to wear your helmets. And then I flipped over it. And when these boys flipped theirs, I'm told. That poor Ryan boy, he was on the back. And he 
he hit his head on a rock and he didn't know what happened after that the next thing he knew is Daniel was standing over him bleeding it was terrible blood was just gushing out of his nose and you know what had happened to Daniel he wasn't wearing his helmet and that handlebar popped his nose and it cut it and he could lift his nose up like that it was so awful oh it was terrible but Daniel was older and he was the responsible one and he was responsible for that Ryan boy and he was scared to death for Ryan because Ryan wouldn't wake up finally Ryan did wake up and it was Daniel that needed the help and he had to go to the hospital and he had to get stitches in all three places of his nose to put it back down and glue it back down so it'd stay there and you know you could find that Ryan boy even today because that Ryan boy when he wears his hair really short and he's doing it right now there's a hole in the back of his head and you can tell where the hair doesn't grow and that's where he popped his head on the rock you could find him you could find him even here after church y'all look for him okay <laughs> if those boys who were always obedient and obeyed their parents rules and put on their helmets none of this would have happened but they forgot that day you know sometimes we do forget and you know Jesus protects it could have been a lot worse for those boys but I'm telling you something kids did you know that the Bible says to wear your helmet did you know that no you never heard that one before it really does yeah, you I'm glad you did some Sabbath school teachers been teaching you right the Bible says to put on your helmet every morning and don't forget because, because say, when it hurts say what your head. well Bible wants us to put on the helmet of salvation the Bible wants us to wear our armor and be ready because when we walk outside Satan's always trying to trick us with stuff like Pastor Tony's been talking about the last few weeks so we need to wear our armor and one of the most important things is wearing our helmet so this week in the morning say mom and dad we need to have prayer we need to put on our helmets before we go to school every day let's put on our helmets all right y'all can go back to your seats now Closing song is There is Power in the Blood. We'll sing the first and last stanza. Shall we be up, bow our heads for prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you that we could be here today in your presence. We have been blessed. <clears throat> and Lord, give us power and give us the helmet of protection all through this next week. And help us to remind us each day to put on that helmet and to be 
with you, and you will be our guide all through each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.